In my coaching techniques, I'm known as the fun coach, so I'm always bringing games and interactive activities to teach a lot of these concepts. So I'm going to share a few of those with you today that hopefully you can take back with you to wherever you are working and make some change. Sound good? Yeah. Awesome. You need a lot of paper. Cool. So how did this get going, Justin? So we started in Agile 2018. We attended a session together and then we're talking afterwards and started realizing this revolving topic of why do we always have these giant backlogs and create these unsuccessful projects, right? So then we started talking and this is how our session evolved. And so we're curious, because you probably wondered what the heck is Icebox Zero, right? So what are you expecting to get out of this session? Something cold. Something cold, okay. <laughs> excuse me, can I squeeze back? I could give you a shoulder, that's cold. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't do that, that's not me. What else are we looking to get out of this session? What got you here other than the signs that say this session is full on all the other rooms? <laughs> User experience, okay. Huh? Simplicity. Simplicity. Somebody read the ashtray. <laughs> I thought it was something that might involve like, activities or workshops. Or something that might involve activities? You know what? I think I have something for you. <laughs> cool. Yep. Thank you. So these are our actual learning objectives. So if none of these look like they fit what you're looking for in this session, um, there's always hallway conversations. <laughs> awesome. All right, so yeah, we're going to learn how to generate value by embracing lean UX, optimize the amount of work that isn't necessary to do. That's the real way to get twice the work in half the time. Um, you know, judge what a healthy backlog looks like. I'm going to show you some experiment patterns. And ideally, we're going to transition from validating these ideas that we have to actually maybe invalidating them, because otherwise there's a lot of confirmation bias. And then hopefully we'll in instill a true sense of purpose and passion in our team members through customer-centered empathy and team autonomy techniques. Yeah, Sound and I good? think even with the keynote this morning, it kind of goes back to escaping the build trap, right? So by using lean UX principles, we're actually able to go to the customer, talk, and validate that we're delivering value, not just output. Now, we may not say things that are entirely profound, right? A lot of it's already been said for us. This comes from the Agile Manifesto. But we have our Twitter handles here. Just in case something profound does slip out, go ahead and tweet us and the hashtag <laughs> AgileAZ. And uh, so, but why simplicity? Why simplicity? Because it's simple. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, life's too complicated. That's right. Uh, well, ultimately what it comes down to is there's just too much to do that can actually be done, right? So, um, you does, know, I, Well, does anybody here ever run out of work? <laughs> Not a lot of hands. <laughs> so a lot of what we do is we're, you know, we still see a lot of this. Speculating what we think a good experience might be. Maybe we go out and t t ask a user, is, is this going to be good, right? A lot of the stuff uh, Melissa said this morning in the keynote. And that's going to still result in a product that isn't solving real customer pain, right? So a lot of times we're putting, uh, we're placing bets, and we're putting all of our eggs in a bat in one basket. And you know what happens when you put a case of eggs in one basket, right? You get a basket case. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So on your pa on your table, you should have some sheets of paper. I would like you to take one sheet of paper and. Make the most beautiful airplane of your entire life. <laughs> These instructions will go away because we're going to continue and we're going to talk about icebox. And this is just one suggestion. You don't have to follow this. Whatever you think is the most beautiful airplane of your life. Cool. Um, so who's actually heard of an icebox with regards to our work? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what it? Okay, so things in your backlog that you're not really work on get put in the ice box. Why do they get put in the ice box? Um, cold. <laughs> <laughs> to keep them cold. <laughs> 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 so 
so that we don't lose sight of them. But if they're not important, why don't we just delete them? Nobody yeah, that's <laughs> true. Let's quote that. Yeah, that's true. All right, cool. Usually Icebox is an unprioritized <coughs> list of work. Mm. Right, so sometimes, so m actually my first actual ever encounter with an Icebox was in an old home that we used to live in that actually had a real ice box. It wasn't in use, but what it is is before refrigeration technology, you would get a big block of ice delivered to your home. It goes in the bottom of this ice box and it kept things cold until fridges were invented. Um, my first encounter with actual hearing the word ice box in actual work was with the tool called Pivotal Tracker, which is similar to Rally or Jira or any of the other tools that we use around work. But the idea was that uh, it is where things that weren't prioritized went until they were prioritized. But what we would often see, we would often see them being abused. People would take stuff, just like you were saying, <coughs> move them off of our backlog or even off of our, you know, we're maybe already even started this, but it's on the back burner now because it's not as important. And so it, so tons of stuff went there, not to be kept on ice, but really to die. It was kind of <laughs> sad. Yeah. Um, so, I like to think of our work as actually perishable, right? All these items have an expiration date. The value that the work we do uh, the value that it provides has an expiration date. Does anyone remember Microsoft Zune? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I may be showing my real age here, but micro so automakers are scrambling to get support for in vehicles for Zune. And then what happened? <laughs> you know, it died. So value expires. Everything we do, everything that we think is going to provide value probably has an expiration date. And this is our idea of icebox zero, right? So I think about a time where, just like Scott was saying, uh, my daughter once, we had a messy fridge, and she asked for milk. So I pour her milk out of it, and she says, Dad, this milk tastes funny. I'm like, nah, it's fine. And then I go ask her to take a drink again. She takes a drink, now she doesn't drink milk. That was almost eight years ago, and I still have fight with this problem. <laughs> when we have a clean backlog, or we have a clean prioritization space, we know that the things we are putting in there still have an acceptable shelf life. We shouldn't be pulling out something from our backlog and saying, hey, is this thing still good? And it's not like you should have to smell your backlog item. <laughs> you should have like a expiration date because that value goes away. Let's say a customer requests something for a new feature, a new addition. If I get to it six months later, they might not even care anymore. It might not be relevant to the pain point they have. That's right. So there's also this idea. There's a point at which if we just keep loading features into the product, it's going to start making the user less happy. And this is where I give my standard disclaimer. I actually don't like the word user. User. <laughs> um, but it's really burdensome to say the humans that use our product. Sometimes we say the customer and that's okay, but the user isn't always the customer. So I do use the term user uh, occasionally, but you know what I really mean is real humans that use our product. Um, back to the keynote too, this goes back to the build trap also, right? So at some point we're just producing more features and not realizing the additional burden we're giving to <coughs> the humans that use our products. Right, so a good product isn't going to necessarily look like a clean ice box or a clean backlog, right? But a clean backlog will result in a better product because we're getting rid of the stuff that if in reality, as we'll talk later, is actually slowing our teams down by having it in there, it's clutter. So uh, we talk about simplicity, right? If your organization was optimized for something, what would it be optimized for? Anybody? What, value? Anybody, what is your orgs optimized for? Does somebody have something? John, Cl John Cutler uses the term feature factory. Does anyone feel like they work at a feature factory? Yes. yes. Right? Just get that thing out the door. It's going to provide value. A lot of speculative uh, communication there. Um, so, but what we see is that organizations aren't optimized to not do the work that actually isn't valuable or is really, in reality, far less valuable than some other things that maybe we don't even realize, right? 
Does anybody get uh, kudos if they remove something from a backlog or remove a feature or some other way of reducing the overall burden of the system? We, we celebrate it. Oh, yeah. fantastic. One. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Two? Okay. There's a fear of paralysis around making that decision. Fear of paralysis around making the decision? Of course. And we, so there's a term data rich but insight poor, right? We have all this data, but it's not really leading to intelligent decisions about where we should go with our product, right? <coughs> so is anyone, would anyone actually spend real money to build the things that you are actually building in your work? Not a single hand. <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> it's okay. I wore black today to mourn for this loss. <laughs> All right, so here's some things we can do for just optimizing for work not done. No gold plating. So avoid excess style on your first release. Just see if it even works. You don't know if that button being left or right is going to be what makes the factor. No future proofing. We don't need to have three layers of interfaces and abstracts and architecture and scaling for things when we don't even know if we have a platform yet. No matrix teams. We should be reducing communication between everybody, right? So if our UX, our product, our business, our customer, and engineers all sat together, we wouldn't have to set up meetings and wait for weeks while our items go stale. And finally, no excess documentation. Our code should be self-documenting, should be clean. We should have uh, the appropriate amount of readmes just to get everybody up and running. And then we should be able to just view the system with uh, minimal overhead. If I have an architecture spec like this big, as an engineer, I'm going to look at the first page and be like, now nah, figure it out as I go. It's right, just really like hard. Melissa said this morning. Yes. Cool. So the first thing, and often we're hearing, who here is working in an organization where you're actually practicing some form of UX? So the first thing, and often we're hearing, who here is working in an organization where you're actually practicing some form of UX? Enablement. Oops. Um, and then we contrast that with job size, right? There's a simpler way to look at this. So I don't look at all of that. I look at what is the reason we're doing this and how are you going to do it? And the idea here is that we're bringing purpose to our engineers. We're asking for an outcome, but we're not telling them, please do it in this manner. Please make the button green. You know, that's, we need to let engineers and designers kind of have that influence, right? If we want to have enabled team, and if we want our teams to feel empowered, we need to give them the ability to make decisions. Um, so the, there is a guy who is no longer with us named David Hussman, and he called it dude's law, the why over the how. So I like to look at it this. So oftentimes you'll look at this as like what is the value proposition or the cost of delay, and this is how much effort is it going to take to uh, build the thing, and then we can actually calculate, calculate that out and come out with a priority. So let's say we have features A, B, C, and D. Uh, well, I'll call them jobs because I actually don't like the term features because when you use the term features, you end up working in feature factories. So let's say we have four things on our plate, right? How do we know we should work on A, B, C, or D first, right? Well, we can actually use um, everyone here familiar with the Fibonacci sequence? Yes. Mm -hmm. And is everyone familiar with relative sizing? Anyone not familiar with relative sizing? You'll get a little taste of it right here. So basically, we are ranking C, B, A, and D, not in that order, against each other, right? So we're only looking at this work that we have to do, and we're saying, which of these is, actually, we start on the low end of the spectrum. Which of these has the least purpose, right? The, high, the lowest cost of delay, or the lowest value going out the door, that sort of thing. And so let's say C is that thing that has the lowest value. So uh, that will automatically get a 1 because Fibonacci starts with 1. For whatever reason, we ignore the next one in the Fibonacci sequence and we go to 2. So we say, are any of these kind of in order of magnitude more than C, right? So let's say B is kind of one order of magnitude, but D is pretty close too, right? It's okay that two things have the same number, right? Let's say A has much more higher order of magnitude of value or cost of delay. So we give it an 8. 
Now we look at the how, right? So we look at what is the simplest thing to do for our engineers out of A, B, C, and D? Maybe we've done B before. Right, right. so we kind of go on past experience. And again, we're using Fibonacci, and we are doing relative sizing. So we start with the simplest thing, B, and then we compare the others to it. So let's say A is about one order of magnitude more complex to build. D is kind of another order of magnitude. And then C, let's say C is uh, another order of magnitude, so 5. So now you can do the math. You divide each of these by each of these. So A it turns out to be 4, B is 2, C is 0.2, and D is 0.67. So now we can calculate what priority we have here. So we actually, A is the first priority, B is the second priority, C is actually fourth priority, so we would do D before we do B. Now notice here, B is actually the simplest thing to do. So often we have this mindset of, well, let's do the simplest thing, get it out the door, build team camaraderie. But we're actually, by doing this, we may be leaving money on the table because this is twice the weight of this, right? So, let's say we did AB. Somebody comes along with E, says this is super important. Okay, well, why is it important? Oh, well, it's GDPR and it has a deadline. Okay, well, that's pretty high on the, on the Y list. But it's also going to be complicated. So it's going to take a lot of effort. So we give it an 8. Again, we are relatively sizing it to these other ones that we've already sized. Now we come up with a weight of 1.625. So now instead of C and D being the highest priority, well D being the next priority, E now becomes the highest priority, D and then C after that. So we do E. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is how we practice responding to change over following a plan, which is in the Agile Manifesto. So now we have covered two Agile Manifesto principles. Two for the price of one. <laughs> cool. So prevention and practice. We have here. Um, oh, we already kind of started, but you said you celebrate your stories being deleted. What, what kind of activities happen when that goes on? Is it someone saying, hey, this is no longer valuable, or how does that happen for you? Um, big parties. Okay. Lots of balloons. Okay. Exactly. And that's kind of joking around and serious, though, but yeah. Scrum says twice the work and half the time, but if we are trying to do two times the amount of work, we're really never going to optimize our, our throughput through the system. So we should be removing things away from the system. Right? And here's some uh, things we can do with that, right? We talked about it once, saying no more. Just say no, right? If it is your professional opinion or there's something technical or there's a, a blocker, let's say no. Um, we should actually try, has anyone ever, uh, you know, when you take one in, you have to, or when you put one in, you have to take one out. Right, so that's a there, right? So John Cutler calls that a feature kill quota. So the idea of, hey, if we add any more to this pile, we need to take something from it. Um, Icebox, here's, let's delete our unprioritized work. If something is so important, it will come back, right? Users will complain again, that item will surface. And finally, some instrumentation, and this is where uh, I live as an engineer. Why don't we measure how many times our code is ran through, right? If we put a new feature out there, we don't celebrate when the feature is released, we should celebrate when that outcome is hit. And if we're not taking the proper care to actually validate those outcomes, whether or not it's Google Analytics, a simple logging framework, something, then how do we even know we're deploying something that our users will actually use? Cool. We heard this other one was uh, kill sheets and graveyards, and this goes back to actually keeping a running list of the ideas that have been uh, removed, so that way we could celebrate those. Yes. So even like performing that context switching exercise, you could say, my team, we're at capacity. 
if I let you put this in, we're not going to meet our sprint commitments. Do you want to pull something out? We've already planned for it. We've already done all these things. By putting it in right now, you're going to get less, right? We've already planned and prepared this work. You're coming at me with a new <coughs> scoped item mid sprint or whatever. There's, do you have a process by which new work enters the system? Yes. Yes. So a, a direct them to that process maybe. Say, hey, we have a way by work gets in. If it's such a high priority, maybe we can have a discussion about it. But right now, I feel like my team is working on what we decided were the most high prioritized things. Yep. Help and to your point, right, uh, there are ways to say no without actually saying the word no. You can probably actually Google this, and there are listicles, and actually that sounds bad. Um, there are also YouTube videos of conference sessions in the past where the people teach other ways to say no besides just saying no. But give a why behind your no and help them understand that it's just temporal, right? It is, it is a no for now. But you can also ask them to qualify their request, right? Show me some research that you've done that proves that this will be value. So if we go back here, right, can you provide evidence why this is a 13, right? Rather than, you know, they just thought of it last night and to them it's the most brilliant idea in the world. That's, there's no better speculation than that. Cool. So, we have a high percent chance of any idea being poor or wrong or, you know, obviously just not the best idea in the world. So I call this uh, and I'm actually writing a book currently titled Margin to Fail. You can find it at leanpub.com slash margin to fail um, if you want to pre-order it. But basically it explores this idea that we have such a high risk of being wrong that we should be trying more things. So, you know, Alice kind of said, you know, sometimes I've believed as many as, we'll put words in her mouth, 10 impossible things before breakfast. And I like this because if we have a 90% chance of failure, how many things do we need to try to guarantee success? And I say that loosely, guarantee. But how many things do we need to try if we have a 90% chance of failure? Any mathematicians in the room? <laughs> I saw 10 fingers. That's right. You have to try 10 things statistically to uh, be correct. There's probably a math statistician out there somewhere that can prove me wrong, but you know, in my feeble mind, you know, he's a nerd and I'm a geek, and the differentiator there is that nerds love math and geeks don't, so. <laughs> and when we say uh, failure, too, it's not just like, hey, it's a complete, like, blow up. Maybe it doesn't have the outcomes you want. As the uh, the uh, cost versus the value isn't where it should be. We should be able to validate these things as we're pushing work through the expensive. We're all expensive individuals. And again, this is a trigger word. This is not the intent of doing this. The intent is to try things and to learn things. And I've had people even say, you know, we've replaced our daily stand-up with a daily, what did you learn? And um, that's become powerful for them, right? So instead of, you know, stand-ups devolving into a status report, it now becomes learning-oriented. And that helps build this mindset, this growth mindset that Carol Dweck talks about in her book, Mindset. So. And then, so next, if we have 10 things to look at, more than a couple, we actually have the ability to choose between options, right? So this is Anchorman, and he said milk was a bad choice, right? But he chose milk. Has anyone here been fed a terrible solution they have to implement on a death march? Yes, it's different when it's fed to you. If you're the one who said, hey, I have to make this decision, there were 10 options, we're gonna do our best, try to fail and learn early and often, all of a sudden we can say, you know what, next time we go out there, I'm definitely taking juice or water, right? I've learned this lesson. Typically when people throw things upon us, we don't learn the lesson as much. We just say, oh, it's that person, there's no reason. We don't have the ability or the muscle to actually make those appropriate choices in the future. That's right. Um, there's also this idea. Anyone seen this before? Uh, so there is a trap, right? It, there's not just a build trap. There is actually a lo what they call the local maximum <laughs> trap. And it's like, basically it goes like this. Oh, you know, we tried two or three things and you know, this one performed better, so we pursued that route. And, you know, we built it and made it look nice and we think it's what people want. And here's where you end up in doing that, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all just guessing until we actually go out and validate or in, 
my opinion, invalidate our ideas, right? And so you, t in or if everything's a dart throw, again, statistically, it's very low likelihood that we will land here if we throw three darts, maybe even ten darts, right? Now, sometimes we do have to climb this smaller peak before we can even see this one, right? Sometimes it's, uh, well, I think Justin talks about how rapidly technology changes and stuff is becoming possible today that wasn't possible before. So this actually keeps moving as well. But unless we try a bunch of things, we'll never actually get here. Now, here's the thing. If it took 10,000 tries to get a light bulb working, right? Why are we trying anything less than 10? Right? And that first light bulb, it definitely wasn't this one, right? We have much better lighting capability today than he had back then, right? So, what does that say about, you know? So everyone's like, oh, we want a 10x product, right? Well, now how many things do you have to try to get that, right? A hundred. Again, someone probably can prove me wrong if they're very good at math, but I, you know, I'm not gonna challenge that. Challenge not accepted. All right, so the cost of definition of ready. Does anybody have a definition of ready in their groups? Okay. So have you ever thought about how much it talks or costs to actually get up to that state? Right? Do you guys do any upfront design? Do you do any architecture documents? Do we have UX in a siloed environment, right? So when we think about actually getting work to a team, there's a lot of cost associated just with that, right? Like. Um, Right now, at the company I'm at, they do anywhere between five dollars to $10,000 just to get it in front of an engineer. But they do large product increment plannings. They spend weeks of, uh, you know, basically in meetings determining what the priorities are. They have a traditional big corporation of America way of approaching this problem. So rather than giving the team uh, work with a little bit ambiguity, they would rather, hey, here's everything to spec. Let's create it this way and then do it in a two-week increment and we'll call it Agile. Right? So when we get to that idea of definition of ready, it should just be a conversation and a problem. Right? So can we go next slide? So like right here, these are all the things. Right? So we have ideation, discovery, prioritization, if it's a heavy framework. right? We have our inventory. Right? In Lean, our excess inventory is one of the biggest forms of waste. And typically, our backlogs and our ice boxes are where most of our waste is. Uh, in the touch time of an actual story, is it a majority of it, is it development, or is it just weight and uh, cues, right? So maybe I get a story done, I have to hand it over to a, a tester, and that takes a week or so, but it only took me an hour. Same goes with our backlogs. If we can reduce the amount of time and get our ideas validated sooner through rapid experimentation, we can actually make sure we're doing the right things. Thank you. Yeah, so um, There is this idea that in the beginning, before we start, or as we are starting something new, is the time when we know the least amount of information, right? So certainty is very low here. There is a lot of uncertainty, but as time goes on, certainty gets better. And if we are doing, if we are practicing UX, you know, Agile UX, and we have a clean backlog, um, we will you know, run those experiments and our learning will grow and we'll get here. Um, and this is why waterfall was terrible too, because we typically get our design and our planning and our documents all the way out over here. Right, so why, why are we creating so much detail about what we think is needed by the customer here when we could just do simple experiments and learn along the way and not spend so much time, you know, on those 42 pages of login documentation or password uh, documentation that Melissa mentioned this morning. Yeah, so this is the value <coughs> of information, right? It is the idea that the amount of money a decision maker is willing to pay before they make a decision, right? So if we only have a shot or two, if we are making like year-long budgets, typically that's why we have a lot of this upfront design, a lot of these prioritization meetings. but if we take more of that UX path, we're actually able to reduce it because we're making a lot more smaller bets instead of one large bet at the very end. So I don't need as much information to say, hey, go make a website and make sure it can do this. We get that, okay, okay, <coughs> now we know what to do next. As opposed to saying, I want an e-commerce platform that's like Amazon, right? There's a lot of different, we may be selling dog collars and don't even need more than a shopping cart from Shopify, mm -hmm. something like that. Yep, so in, in reality, the higher we, 
No, the more we know, right, the higher it costs to know those things. So we shouldn't demand so much certainty in the beginning, so much uh, fruitless research without even talking to customers and trying things, right? Um, it is actually the last 20% of a, of a product is 80% of the cost of it, right? Pareto principle. Yep. Yeah, so even too, so when we actually do get the work, we should be breaking it down into more finite tasks, right? So if you're giving me a problem, I'm gonna go work with the UX, that's different. But by the time it makes it to the actual implementers, it should have a little bit of wiggle room on how it's done. But we should be working on one small experiment, testing one or so variables at a time. So just like me mowing my grass, if I'm gonna go mow my grass, I know how long it's gonna take. If there's a little bit of mishaps along the way, like I'm out of gas, I know how much it takes to go to the, to the gas station and back. But I'm not saying, hey, I'm gonna detail and manicure the whole yard in under an hour. Right? We want to keep our tasks small and relatively sized compared to our other things. So that way when we go and we actually implement, we either get that feedback real quick. We're not taking months or weeks to just even put an idea out there. We should be working on small, concise experiments, testing one or so variables at a time. That's right. So there's some alternatives to what you're probably doing now, right? Um, So you have probably familiar with user story mapping. Is anyone actually really doing this? A Not a, OK. <laughs> um, how are you finding that helpful? Uh, we find it really helpful, uh, especially in uh, trying to break down the tasks to the small sizes that you know, we know we can get done within a reasonable amount of time. Right, so I, en I encourage you, look into user story mapping, but try it from an experimentation mindset. Try it from a, these are all the things that we can do with our product. Uh, there's a really good uh, book by Jeff Patton called User Story Mapping. He fears that that's the thing he's going to be most known for in his life. Um, but try it with an experiment, right, mindset. If we, let's say, our f to solve whatever problem we have, we could do this thing or this thing or that thing or that thing. Right? That's kind of what story maps look like anyway. And we may not ever implement half of that stuff, but just that idea can generate, or just that activity can generate all the ideas that we can then go run experiments on. Um, there's also dual track agile where engineers and designers are pairing up. And for one sprint, they're doing discovery. And then for the next sprint, they're doing delivery. And then for the next sprint, they're doing discovery. And the next sprint, they're doing delivery. That is a great way to do it. Um, and then lean startup, of course, uh, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about prototyping and, and things along those lines, but uh, that is kind of lean startup. Validate your idea before you even write a single line of code. I think that's how I would summarize it, right? So whole team, this is another concept also. So with dual track agile, the idea is that you have engineers and UX and all those people working <coughs> on the discovery together. Right? So if Scott comes back after two weeks and brings me a document or a, a video, it's not as valuable as me going out and empathizing and seeing with the customer. And imagine too, like over here, this is the NASA Command Center. The whole team is available to respond and change on an instant. So while we're doing discovery, I might say, holy crap, if I just change this small part of the code, we could get that feature out to the customer tomorrow. I might have insights where if I'm actually working with the person beside me, rather than having those delays and feedback loops. So I've noticed an interesting observation. Uh, a few of you in the room have your phones out. I think we might have maybe encouraged you and you're currently deleting something on that phone right now. <laughs> but if not, I would like you to take out your phone and delete something on that phone right now. You may have an email that no, is no longer needed. You might have uh, some alarms that you're never going to use again. You might have reminders. The, the WOVA app, right? <laughs> the WOVA app, yeah. Closed out all my browser tabs. I had 17 tabs. Uh, someone had time. switched insurances in the past and left the, the old app on there. So you might have an old insurance app that you no longer need. So as you're deleting something, shout out what you're deleting. I'm deleting apps. Pictures. Apps, pictures, okay. Apps. I gotta save all my videos. <laughs> He's saving all his games. Those are providing memes. value. Memes. Oh, memes. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing, though, too. When you delete something, don't you smile? 
it feels good to get rid of things, right? So you have less burden. Like, again, I, I remove 17 browser tabs. They'll come back if they're important. Mm -hmm. right? A lot of them were conference schedule and looking up stuff for this, but yep. yeah. So Because everything has an expiration date. Uh, so now what we want you to do, now that we've got the ball rolling, we want you to take a, you know, a strip of paper and write down a stale feature, something from your real backlog at work that you think shouldn't be there. Write that down uh, on just a strip of paper. Not like, we don't want whole sheets of paper, but like maybe on the small sheets we gave you earlier, just rip a strip off. Write down a stale feature that you think should be deleted. And I will collect those from you in a minute. <clears throat> so, just for example, for me, I wrote uh, old Spectro client. So we have a feature toggled in the system that's been there for two years, and they still keep on wanting to add things to the new way, and we have to implement it in the old way. It is unfortunate, but a two-year feature that has supposed to be deprecated. So take that feature in your hand right now and just crush it. Wrinkle it up. <laughs> Make it as tight of a wad as you can and uh, gather them in a single pile on your table. Cool? So, you know, we have user stories, but I talked a little about how we can use uh, story mapping to actually craft, you know, think of what we want to experiment with and uh, generate ideas about what we should try. Um, we can actually write user stories like this as well. It can look as simple as this. If we do X, then persona Y, uh, will do some desired outcome and then we'll know when it's real once certain metric. So, you know, as with the SMART goals, we want our experiments, our hypotheses, there's also the hypothesis story, which is similar but different, um, should be measurable. We should actually be able to know and quantify that that thing is, you know, meets a certain outcome and then we can know right away when it doesn't. But if we're trying multiple things together, we'll know that one of those things far and away blows the metric away versus all the other ones, which may have met our original metric requirement if we only tried a few things, right? So that, you know, the example of the local maximum trap right there. Huh? Yeah. Um, so think about it like this, right? You're playing Battleship with a friend. Anyone not know how to play Battleship? So basically you put ships on a, a grid and then you can't see the other person's ships and then you're calling like A1, B2 and it's either a hit or a miss and when it's a hit the other person calls out hit and that's how you know you've hit their boat and when you hit all you know, some boats have three pegs, some have five. When all those pegs are hit, then you've sunk that ship, right? So now let's say you're playing it like this. One of you can call out 20 shots at once, okay? But they're not going to tell you, they're only going to tell you whether you've hit some or missed some, but they're not going to tell you exactly where they were hit, and also, by the way, they get to do one at a time and respond to change when they realize that you've hit something, right? So who would rather play with 20 shots all at once and not even knowing what you're hitting, right? Who would rather play with one shot at a time to be able to respond with that very uh, agile, or Alan Casey actually came up with that. Uh, salvo fire is, you know, 20 shots at once and then you respond. And by the way, you s there's still a lot of details missing. So we want to work in organizations like this where we're able to respond and adapt quickly to what we've learned. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's great. Not uh, your planes. It's not until we actually Stale go features. either like a gimbal walk, we actually do the work with the person, or we observe them in their natural environment that we're actually going to see those pains emerge. Right? All up until then, it's just speculation, as Scott's been saying. If you actually take a group of engineers in the U.S. and they see somebody has a problem and we know that we can fix it, that's exciting. Like, hey, there's a, a serious pain in the system right now, and we saw it at this plant, and we got here and saw this customer, and I want to make sure that they can do their job better. It helps build that empathy when they actually go out. Scott, next slide. You'll have to do it. Alright, so again, uncovering these through behavioral observations. We can do this with site maps, right? Jobs to be done. 
uh, competitor analysis, mind map and networking, uh, actually ask the person, go out and say, hey, can I sit with you, can I come? Uh, Melissa Perry mentioned having some kind of organizational structure by which you can have a frequency and an interval or a, a guidelines by which you interact with those customers, right? Um, that software costs more than employee time. Has anyone ever heard that person that's too busy when you build something for them? Like, so me building the wrong thing is going to be less expensive than your time. We can also use code analytics and UI, but that normally tells us the what, not the why. And if you want to get real fancy data science techniques, such as um, doing regressions and putting things in a neural network, it starts getting typically higher there. So right, we're kind of going quick now, too. All right, so empathy. Typically what we know, what we assume is the behavior, right? So even when we're actually observing someone, we're seeing the behavior. Without under understanding the true underlying needs and wants, it's really hard to create something that's going to uh, solve that pain problem for them. If I say that someone is just, uh, again, struggling through software, it's like, oh man, they, maybe they're not very technologically, technologically proficient. But if I actually go sit with them, have a conversation, like, oh, maybe it's our software is the problem. Um, I was making assumptions before, I see that whoever plays on their phone all the time can go Google search things. Maybe it, it isn't just the behavior, it's the, their underlying need is that the software should be more simple. Yep. Um, so ultimately what we're looking for is we're looking for pain. If we can identify pain, I think it's, that says it simply. That will kind of drive our why, and then again, we allow the engineering team to understand the how. Um, and we build something, again, this is the trap, right? We don't have to build it in code. I'll show you right here in a minute. But we can build a simple experiment, test and validate and measure, and then learn whether we should continue in that direction or not. Um, so this is kind of what they look like, right? We come up with a hypothesis, we experiment, we analyze, we draw a conclusion, and then we observe and question, you know, the, uh, in their context, ideally. All right, so there's tons of different experiment patterns, and you can take a picture of this um, to look these up. Because ultimately what we're doing is we, uh, we're not really going too deep. It's kind of like we're getting into the kiddie pool and we're walking across it. But we're not swimming in it because most of that is not water. Uh, and we're not diving in because that's not safe. But so th this is, these are things that you can do without code. Well, A-B test kind of requires code and phase rollout. But these two things can be done without code, as can these two, um, to understand how the user will behave and whether they'll actually adopt your, uh, your product. Um, and how long should experiments take? I actually spoiled it for you. It's three days. You, it should take no more than three days to design an experiment and run it, get that feedback. You could take the next two days of the week to uh, analyze and, and figure out where to go next. Yeah, um, this is like evolving landscape. This is what we were saying with the build maximum trap. If we're trying to spend six months to form a solution, who knows if Azure or Google or Amazon has come out with a cognitive service that already does the thing you're looking for, like image recognition, machine learning, NLP, all of these things are basically commodities nowadays. Yep. And so if, if, in my mind, there are really only three ways to truly validate a product, to design an experiment that validates rather than invalidates, and that is time, Reputation and money. Is someone willing to spend time uh, working with you on the prototype? Do they care about the problem enough that they're willing to do that? Uh, if not, are they willing to refer someone? So use their reputation to refer someone to you who might spend the time, who cares about that problem. But ultimately, it comes down to money, right? Kickstarter. Is someone willing to pay money to have this problem solved? Um, and there's simple ways we can prototype, which uh, you'll briefly yeah, this touch. This was like the moon lander. They um, said, oh my goodness, the flag on the moon is going to be straight down. How do we get it up? An uh, engineer was able to sketch this in a matter of minutes using actual measurements and prototypes. Uh, I'm sorry, piece parts. And they were saying, hey, this will fit this telescoping pole. We can still fit it in. It's still load requirements before even actually uh, trying to build it. Yep. This is like uh, for the NASA moon lander. So you can do this too, right? Uh, a simple sketch is all it takes. And there's a tool right here called marvelapp.com where you can literally sketch on paper, take a picture of that sketch, and make it interactive. So you can sketch a UI and make it interactive. Um, so Marvel App, I'll have a slide with this at the end. Um, but right now we want to kind of 
to have you throw your paper airplane that you've spent a lot of time on, somewhere in the room is a hidden target that you're not aware of, and we're going to see how many people hit that target. I'm going to extend it. What? Are we, we probably won't do the time. <laughs> All right, let's see if anyone hit the target. Nope, no one hit the volunteer, so good for him. Um, so you tried one thing, you threw your airplane and it failed because you didn't hit the target. So now, uh, what you can do is, I want you to take this activity with you, have your stakeholders or your designers throw, make one beautiful airplane, throw it to some hidden target in the room. Make sh I mean, it's highly unlikely that someone will hit the target. Now have a different target when you run this activity. Uh, have them do as many airplanes as they can and just make an airplane, throw it again. The second round, it's going to be lower fidelity, right? Simple is the object there, and then surely we'll, someone's going to hit the target most likely. If you, if you, I mean, in a room this big, absolutely. Um, so let's talk about this term just real briefly, uh, the MVP, right? It shouldn't look like this. Oh, and by the way, it shouldn't look like this either, right? Because what do you see here? You see a frowny face, but is that valuable to someone? So it should actually look like this. We are, oops, sorry. Um, we are providing value and we're making people happy. Oh, and now we're iterating. But you notice anything here when we go from two to three? We threw this away. So your MVPs should be thrown out. MVPs are not something that we launch. We're providing a little bit of value. A lot of the value is with learning. And we throw it away when we're done. So now what we would like to do is we would like to take your backlog items and we're going to throw them away in this, uh, I'm calling it a backlog dumpster. Well, that was a spectacular fail. All right, there we go. Woo! So they are gone forever. You cannot undelete these backlog items now. So make sure they get thrown away when you get home. All right, that is all we have for you, but thank you for coming. Here's the resources that we recommend. The Marvel app, as well as Lean UX, the book. And connect with us.